What I'm going to be speaking about is the split between spirit and matter. For centuries, the Judeo-Christian tradition has been splitting spirit and matter. Going way back to the story of the Garden of Eden, matter, which is the Latin word for mother, was associated with Eve, with the serpent, with evil, with greed, with lust, hate, jealousy, all these things that are not compatible with the good life. Spirit, on the other hand, was lifted up as the great ideal which we should all be trying to achieve. Even in New Age thinking, light and the ideal can be very seductive. There's an energy that would like to transcend this terrible earth. And in my work with addicts, I see again and again that the addict is trying to escape his own or her own humanity. Hates what it is to be human. Doesn't want to accept the lust, greed, war, filthiness of being on this earth wants to escape into some kind of transcendent reality. So that the gap between spirit and matter is getting bigger and bigger because we are living in an addicted society. And most of us know well enough the voice coming from spirit that says, You are not good enough. Spirit, when it is just allowed to float in a disembodied way, can be murderous because it is judgmental, it is self-righteous, and it says to us poor slugs down here, you are not good enough. You have not got courage. You can't even stop eating. You can't stop drinking. You really aren't good enough to be alive. Why don't you just give up and die? So that at the center of the dark, rejected side is a death wish. And the the rejected side is this whole area that is in the body. It's it's denigrated, it is matter. And matter is somehow opaque, dense, less than spirit. And most of us, even when we're, we're working hard to try to bring these together, this other voice keeps coming in and we think we're not good enough. We shouldn't be greedy. We shouldn't be lustful. We shouldn't have hate. Only Saddam Hussein has hate. And these projections go out onto other people. You see, because we reject our own humanity, we reject what Jung calls the shadow side, we push that down into the unconscious, and the minute we do that, we start projecting it out onto someone else, so that someone else has to carry our so-called darkness. What I'm suggesting is that we have to now begin to own our own darkness. Those of us who have been addicts or are addicts know what it is to have to accept 
our darkness. We have treated our bodies as garbage dumps. We have allowed them to be polluted with poison. We have run them until they're absolutely exhausted. Workaholism is an addiction as much as anything is. And in that addictive behavior, the body has been disowned. And the feeling that is in the musculature of the body is disowned. So that the very riches of what makes us human, the substance that makes us human is disowned. So that what I'm suggesting is that we have to go back and look at what we call darkness and realize that there's a different way to look at darkness. Darkness, of course, is associated with the feminine. The goddess was thrown out of our culture long ago. And as I'm looking at dreams both individually and collectively, I'm seeing that the goddess is determined now to come back in. In a new way, she has never been conscious on the earth before. So that there's a new consciousness, a mutation in consciousness taking place. And it's our task to voice that consciousness. And to do that, we have to take a totally new look at what matter, mother, is. What darkness is. I mean, who of us would want to live in a world with no darkness? Night is as precious as is day. Night is a time of a totally different rhythm, a synthesizing, a coming together, a pearl light that illumines from within. And as we come closer to our darkness, we see something totally new. The new light always comes out of the dark side. So the the task that I see us facing is the task of coming up against that wall. Most of us have to crash into the wall before we can wake up. I've never seen it in Nelson yet that got very far if they didn't crash into the wall. And I imagine most of us have crashed. Because it takes that, stupid as we are, to to bring, to waken us up. Sometimes the crash is a heart attack. Sometimes it's cancer in ourselves or in somebody we love. Or it can be a breakdown in relationship or a continual breakdown in relationships until one day we say, there may be something wrong with me. It can't always be the other person. And of course, the other wall that we're now facing is the earth itself. So that all this that we have been putting behind us and saying, it isn't happening, it isn't happening, it isn't happening, the denial of the addict, eventually we have to say it is happening. And this is the very energy that can waken us up. Instead of looking then at the world as an either-or, black-and-white world, 
We have to begin to see it differently. If we think of spirit on one side and matter on the other, those of you who have thought about trying to integrate spirit into body, you know it doesn't want to come. Those of you who have ever worked with anorexics or are anorexic yourself, the spirit is not the slightest bit interested in staying in body. It doesn't like it. It wants to fly. It wants its ideals. It wants beauty and truth and light. And you sure don't get that here. So there is spirit. Here is matter. If you have enjoyed living in dark matter all your life, you know how hard it is to bring it into consciousness. If you've never disciplined yourself with food, the first time you say to your wild animal, no, you're not having chocolate cake, it says, I want it. You've always given it to me. Why don't you give it to me now? And you say, well, I'm not going to give it to you now. Well, you are. <laughs> Just get it. Stop the clowning around. And unless you've got a very good ego, you will get it. Because matter is not disciplined. The same thing with sexuality. If you've always acted out your sexuality and your, your animal gets a little randy over here and you say, no, not, it's, what? What's the matter? Not this time? No. Well, don't be silly. So we see what happens, those of you who have been through this know well enough, it is a crucifixion. You have to hold the tension of the opposites. Now, in our culture, this is not a popular idea. Most of us in this room who've been through therapy have had to hold the hold the tension of the opposites. As human beings, that's what we're about. We are part spirit, part animal. But to bring those both into the divine area of love is to hold the tension of the opposites and not let either arm drop. So that you don't say to yourself, well, I will love my wife in spirit. She's a good woman. She's just like my mother. Only we don't usually say that. And she is the mother of my children. I will love her in spirit. That and there. Now, I will drop that hand and I will go to my mistress. She is fulfilling my lust. She is bringing out something in me that my wife cannot bring out. I cannot let this side of myself die. So I will live this side here. And when I go home, I will drop this hand and bring up this one. But to hold the tension of the opposites is something else. To be able to hold on to, in the same consciousness, the love of both is something else. That's where the crucifixion takes place. In that pulling of tension, the energy is transformed. Something will happen to change the energy, and a third will emerge. A totally other consciousness will come in the dreams that will bring the two together. Or to go back to our addict, 
in simplest language, but a holding of the tension. You come home at night, you've had it, you've always had a drink, and you say, no, I will not have a drink. And your animal says, I will, and you say, I will not. Is there not something that you would like rather than alcohol? I need some spirits. Get it. And you say, well, maybe a different kind of spirit. Maybe Mozart. Huh. Mozart? <laughs> Not interested in Mozart. I want some alcohol. See what I mean? The tension? Now, both are spirit. The one is concretized. The other is free. The same thing with food. The animal says, I want sweetness. I'm starving for sweetness. And indeed, it may be starving for sweetness. And you say, if you are dialoguing with it, if you are trying to bring it to consciousness, you try to talk to it. You try to hold the tension. And you say, before you get to the refrigerator, because it's too late once you're at the refrigerator, you say, maybe you would like to dance. Maybe that would be the sweetness that you would like. Huh, I don't want to dance. I want some chocolate. Now, we've always had chocolate at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm going to have it now. And you have to hold and say no. And especially when you go to see your parents or you go to a party and everybody else is having a lovely time with the food and you're saying, I am going to stay with the conflict. And it's that conflict that stretches us to the point where we start to build our own container where we start to come into our own body and feel the rage. Why do we keep stuffing stuff down our throats? What is it we're trying to keep down there? It's the shadow energy. We don't want to feel the anger. If you think of the anger in that fist, and you think of this other hand trying to hold it down. That's the volcano we dream about. And look at the magnificent energy that is just wasted. And when it's been wasted long enough, it turns against us. It comes back for its revenge. And the cells that never had a chance to live take off in cancer, or some other kind of illness. So that it's this, it's this energy in matter that I'm really speaking for tonight. I feel her grief. God knows I felt it in my own body. I see it in the bodies of the people that are sitting opposite me. I see it in the earth watching the, the cormorant. I'm sure many of you saw that picture of the cormorant during the war, that bird covered with oil, not understanding what on earth had happened to it, trying to get up on a wall. And those of us who saw it, the heart breaks for the innocent creature, for the innocent world, for the rainforest, weeping its sap after the fire has gone through. And our own bodies are crying in the same way if we get below the neck with our consciousness. The grief, the anger, the jealousy, it's all here. And we call it shadow. We we don't want to own it, and by not owning it, we are not embodied, 
and we are disempowered. Without our body, we cannot speak our truth because we're coming from head. And you may think you're speaking the truth from head, but I can tell you, if something happens and you lie down and change the energy and somebody puts their hand on your heart and belly, you will cry. And there's truth in the tears. So we're coming down into the roots of the darkness. And in going down into those roots and allowing the, the shadow energy to be recognized in a different way. For example, let's look at greed. If, if you have a food complex and you are just plain greedy and you cannot say to yourself, I am greedy. But if you look at your life pattern, you'll see greed all over the place. But if you can go into that greed and talk to it and say, what is it you want? And the greed may say, I want something, but I don't know what it is. But it's something I have to have. And then you think of the wolf. And the wolf at extremes are full of wolves. The wolf is the animal of Apollo. Apollo is the god of the sun. The wolf wants to go towards light. It has that burning passion to go toward light. If it gets moving towards darkness, towards greed for the concrete, its passion is just as immense. But if you try to talk to that wolf consciously, it will tell you it wants, it wants something else. And eventually that, that energy can be turned toward the light and away from the dark, concretized energy, which eventually splits spirit and body in two. So in, in pulling together, in, in, see, in trying to pull in that energy from the shadow, you are pulling in a new consciousness. And remember that the holy divine children, all through the history of religion, the divine child has come out of the darkness. Christ coming out of the cow stable. No room in the inn. There never is room for the new consciousness in the inn. And the new consciousness is having to slip in the back door. But that's the way the new integration takes place in the individual and in the collective. And then we move to the both and kind of thinking instead of the split either or. This is feminine thinking that brings the both and together. And in that work that we do in talking to our own shadow, in owning it, in embodying it, we are empowered. You see, once you've done this, you're not going to be judgmental of other people. You know what a mess you are yourself. And you forgive yourself. And you don't find yourself making judgments on other people. 
or being self-righteous. And your heart opens in compassion. And here's where the healing of ourselves heals others. How can we hear with triumph that 100,000 Iraqis were killed? How can we look at those children without breaking hearts? They are us. And there's the integration. And the compassion in our heart opens to them. It's through our wounding and our suffering that we learn to love. And it's through that love that the very cells of our body are lit with a new light. In dreams, as this begins to happen, the black Madonna begins to appear. As I see the black Madonna, she is the manifestation of God in matter. That's what I call Sophia. That's what I call the goddess. The manifestation of God in matter, right there. And she comes through sometimes in rashes, vaginitis, trouble in the throat, all kinds of ways. She says, see me. And if you can't see me in health, see me in illness. And I will talk to you and I will help you. In dreams, she may be underneath the concrete of a city, trying her best to push through the concrete. She may be in a 10-foot cage, all huddled up. One of my dream, one of my analysands dreamt that this magnificent big chocolate woman was in this 10-foot cage, all huddled up like this. And the dreamer said there was a big party going on in the front lawn. And the dreamer said to her, what are you doing in that cage? She said, they put me here. The dreamer said, and who are you? And she said, who do you think is giving the party? Isn't that marvelous? You walk out today and you see the daffodils and you see the apple blossoms and you see the new green on the trees. Who do you think is giving the party? And it's here, ladies and gentlemen. It's not in heaven on the other side. The incarnation is, and we haven't caught up to it yet. But I really believe that's what it's all about. That there is a wisdom in matter. That there is a consciousness in matter, in the earth itself, which is alive. Those of you who've been through illness, you know the wisdom that comes through your own cells. You know the connection between your cells and other people. The connection of your cells to the earth. Many people were going through agony while the war was on because they were sensing it. And they didn't know why they were sick. So that there's a consciousness, a new sensitivity in the body that is coming making us realize that we are all one. And it's through the illumination uh, of, of the, what I would call the love, not in any sweet strawberry slush kind of way, but love that is strong and love that has the power to heal. And it comes through loving our crooked neighbor with our own crooked heart, to quote Auden. I love that. Loving our crooked neighbor with our own crooked heart. That's real love. Not this idealized kind of illusion, which is a lie. 
It's all based on rejection of the shadow. We are living in the atomic age. And the atomic age is all about energy in matter. Energy that wants to be released. Energy that wants to be made conscious. This is the goddess energy. She wants to be released. Uh, let me tell you a couple more dreams. The, the, the big chocolate woman comes to the dreamer and says, here is cream, rub it on yourself. And the dreamer takes the cream, rubs it on, and every place the cream goes, it permeates the body. By the way, this person is sick with uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And the, the, the whole body is permeated with the light of this cream. Or a man dreams that he's cutting the lawn. As the grass flies, the light flies with the grass. Another woman dreams that her body is lying in a room, a plastic doll the same size as she is. The chocolate woman comes in, raises her hand, and the radiant light from the hand disintegrates the body. There's nothing left after that radiation. In other words, once she is touched by that light, the persona, the performance, the plastic disintegrates. There's a reality. And this figure is in many dreams. Now, she may appear in many different forms. Uh, for example, she may appear as, as white buffalo woman. She may appear in, in many different Indian forms or even Asian forms. But the unknown that is trying to come through, that recognizes our embodiment as the bridge that can bring together spirit and body in love. And surely that's the love that can encompass other people and the planet itself. But it's the consciousness that makes it possible. Without the consciousness, it can happen. Tyard de Chardin has said that we will conquer for ourselves the energies of wind, gravity, waves. But one day, we will harness for God the energies of love. And then, for the second time, in the history of the world, we will have discovered fire. Well, I'd like to leave it there and ask you if you have anything in all of that that you'd like to discuss. Yes. My understanding is that by working with matter, whatever sort of object, and in ritual, that one might help oneself or another become aware or bring to consciousness material that you're not aware of before. Now, I'm assuming that that would be part of your goal with the dream work. I don't put any kind of program on dream work because in, in, the, in my understanding of dreams, there is a process in the unconscious that goes on. The river flows in the unconscious as it is going to flow. 
I, I can always remember my own analyst in Zurich. I was in a, quite a terrible state at the time because I felt that I was being taken where I didn't want to go, which I was. And I was doing my best to try to control it. And Dr. Bennett said, you know, Mrs. Woodman, you're going to walk down the road. And you can either go like a pig being drawn to the slaughter, squealing all the way, or you can walk with as much grace and consciousness as you can muster. <laughs> now that's about it. You know, most people go squealing like a pig to the slaughter. And we all do until we realize that we're for it. And then we either have to surrender or, or whatever. But that, that, that current, that river that goes through the unconscious is our own personal river. And the, the farther you go in the process, the deeper you tap into that river. This is what being in the Tao is. And when you're in Tao, this, what I'm calling the, the great... Black Madonna or the Great Mother, the, the forces of the universe, whatever you want to call them, are on our side because we are dialoguing with that. And doors just fly open because you're on the path. And Jung says, once you're on the path, you're at the goal. You forget the goal because it's so hard to keep on the path that you can't be thinking about the goal. You know, you, you just have to keep measuring every step to try to stay on. And the dream will tell you if you're off. But Jung believed that there is a natural gradient towards wholeness in the psyche, that the psyche wants us to be whole people. So that just as the, at the point where you think you've got it made and all together, all of a sudden you fall in love with somebody else or your job collapses or something goes wrong that opens up a whole new part of yourself. Now, if, to go back to what I was saying, if you say, this cannot happen to me, I'm not going to have this, chop. I'll stay with this. You will never be whole. You'll have one arm that's rigid. And all this beautiful part will be paralyzed. But the energy will be coming through another way. So that I trust that the dreams will take the person where they're supposed to go. And I just surrender to that. All I try to do is help them to understand the symbols. See, from, the, from this point of view, the symbol is the healer. This great Madonna, for example. She, you see, she brings together the Madonna energy up on the, here's the splitting, the Madonna energy up on the pedestal, and the whore energy down in the pit. The black Madonna is traditionally connected with childbearing, sexuality, lust, fruitfulness. The whole lusciousness of the earth is in that figure. But she also has the Madonna energy that can produce the new consciousness so that she brings together the feminine in men and women, because let's face it, women are as split in the feminine as are men. And men are as split in the masculine as are women. Most men have a Don Juan or a homosexual shadow balancing reliable dad. I'm sorry to be so stark and explicit, but that's generally the way it is. And, and the... And women have the same kind of stuff. We've inherited it from our parents. We have all this unconscious baggage that we're carrying around. And what I'm talking about is trying to free ourselves from the unconsciousness of our parents. 
so that we are free to live our own lives. I've gone around that question. That's the, but the symbol, I would use the word mystery rather than magic. Because having been an addict, I loved magic. Something magic was going to happen. But it never did anything but land me in difficulty. But, but the, the mystery is the depth of the sacred. I mean, it, it's just words. It doesn't matter which word you use. But I, I, the, the, the symbol, you never know exactly what it means. You never can say that is what the dream means. Because the symbol will open and open and open. Fifteen years later, you think, oh, that's what that dream was about. But the symbol has a, a meaning for the mind, a meaning for the heart, and a meaning for the imagination. Think of Macbeth, out, out, brief candle. The candle is life, it's meaning. You can see the image of your own life, a brief candle that one day goes, and it strikes the heart. And for one moment, you have that goose flesh that just goes right through you, and you are whole. And that's the touchstone on which you can remember what it was to be whole for at least a moment. That's what analysis is all about. For one hour a week, you sit and and hope that for a moment, you will experience that totality. That's why the symbol heals. Yes? When you hold the dynamic tension and the rage wells up, what is the rage for? What is the meaning? What is the meaning of the rage? What is it about, I guess, is what I want to say. Of course, it depends on the individual. You have to always realize that there, there's individual anger. But there's, for me, there's personal anger. Beneath that, there's archetypal rage. And I think one reason that a lot of us are afraid to get into anger is because we're, we're afraid we'll go into rage. Then we are possessed. And God help the man that's on the end of that. Right? And I've had Alison say, poor bastard, Mary, honestly, I don't know what I did to him, but he didn't deserve it. <laughs> but you see, what happens, she taps into the anger, and all of a sudden, the rage comes up. And it's centuries of rage against the feminine. Now, men are beginning to realize that their feminine has been treated the same way. And their rage is beginning to come up around this. It happens on both the masculine and the feminine. And I'm not using those words gender-wise. In men and women, it happens in both the masculine and feminine. My sense of the deepest rage is nobody ever saw me. Nobody ever heard me. As long as I can remember, I have had to perform. When I tried to be myself, I was told, that's not what you think. That's not what you ought to do. So that I was never mirrored. Nobody saw me. And so I put on this false face, and my life has been a total lie, and somebody is going to see me. I don't know if that rings any bells for you people. Yeah. You see? And, and it's, 
It's just a little child saying, I will not fragment any longer. I am going to be who I am once. And if you don't like me, to hell with you. This is who I am. But that rage just burns through. And it needs to. But it doesn't need to be focused on somebody else. Because that's projection. And we, this is what I'm saying. If we're even ever going to get along with our mates, we're going to have to deal with our own shadow. Because otherwise, how can we have intimacy when we lie to ourselves? You know, how can we ask our mate to be intimate with us when we're lying to ourselves about our own truth? Another question. Yes. One way to get in touch with the shadow is to resist addictive needs and experience the rage of not succumbing to that and finding out where that need comes yeah. from. And that's shadow work, along with dream work. That's just a new approach for finding the shadow for me. I'm glad to hear that. Well, yeah. I mean, I think that, that certainly an addict faces the shadow every time they want the addictive substance. And the energy just comes welling. And you don't realize how strong that energy is until you say no. And it just says, aha, you do what I want you to do. And, the, and, and the, how many of you know that as soon as you say, I'm never going to have another cigarette, that's when you want a cigarette. And the energy just wells up. And at the root of that, when you really get to the root, you find an energy that is determined to take your life. So that it becomes a real struggle between good and evil. And the little soul is in the middle. But until you put it to that kind of test, you never know. The, you see, you never know the power of the shadow, but look at the beauty of the energy. Some women who have found their sexuality, some men who are just beginning to realize what sexuality is, are realizing the beauty of their shadow at 65 or 70, some of them. Now, that's grief. But it's better to find it late than never. <laughs> but I tell you, that grief will open your heart to incredible love. But it has to be dialogued to get it to consciousness. Let me just give you one tiny Zen koan to take with you to sleep on. You see, poetry gives you images to dream on. Here's how I see it. It's the blade in the fire. And we are riding that razor's edge. Ride your horse along the edge of the sword. Hide yourself in the middle of the flame. Blossoms of the fruit tree bloom in the fire. The sun rises in the evening. Let's hope our sun rises in the evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much.